the truth about God that He will be good no matter what. In every circumstance, in every experience that we go through as believers, God remains good. As my brother quoted earlier, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which says, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. All things work out for good. Why? Because God is good. Amen. Amen. Now, the passage that we're going to be looking at today is uh, James. James chapter 5. James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 13 to verse 18. I'm going to be reading as you follow in your Bible and listen. The Word of God declares, If any among you suffer, then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him. Anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Yeah. Verse 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Yeah. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Let's pray. Father, I come before your throne in this moment as one of your humble servants, absolutely terrified that I'm about to preach to your people. Because if I say anything that is not of your word, I stand in judgment. If I say anything that is not biblical, I stand in judgment. For your word says in James chapter 3 verse 1, that not many of us should become teachers because we will incur a stricter judgment. So in this moment, Lord, I pray that the notes I wrote down last night was pleasing to you. And that if you are pleased to let me say something else that is not in my notes, that is related to this topic, do so as you please, Lord. I ask that your word will go forth with power, conviction, and the Holy Spirit. That those who are saved may be sanctified and those who are not saved may be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this message is entitled, The Power of Prayer. And Bishop called me yesterday and told me that he wanted me to give a message. He said that he's giving messages, series of messages on the power of prayer. That the topic I should have today must be the power of prayer. And it caused me to sit back and think, what passage am I going to preach about concerning the power of prayer since I know so many? Because when you study God's word more than I do or as much as I do, you know a lot about the word of God and a lot of scriptures come to mind. And it is as if the words of the page of God's book is jumping off in your face saying, preach me, preach me, preach me. And you have to pick one of them to preach. So the one I decided to preach about is James chapter 5. And the main verse is verse 16. But I don't want to preach on verse 16 without giving you the context. Because context is very important. Going verse by verse through the Bible is very important. Because one could easily disconnect a thought or a phrase or a verse from its larger context and give a meaning to it that does not conform to the Word of God. Now, the book of James is a very, very interesting book. One could divide the book of James in 14 sections. Verse 1 in chapter 1 could be the introduction. Chapter 1, verse 2 to verse 12 could be the test for perseverance and suffering. Chapter 1, verse 13 to verse 18 could be the test of blame in temptation. Chapter 1, verse 19 to verse 27 could be the test of response to the Word of God. 
Chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 13 can be the test for impartial love. Chapter 2, verse 14 to verse 26 could be the test for righteous works. The other one could be the test of the tongue, which is mentioned in chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 12. The other one could be the test of humble wisdom, mentioned in chapter 3, verse 13 to verse 18. The ninth section could be test of worldly indulgence. Do Christians indulge in worldly things? Chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 12. The other one could be the test of dependence upon God. In chapter 4, verse 13 to verse 17. The next one could be the test of patient endurance. Chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 11. The next one could be the test of truthfulness and faithfulness in chapter 5, verse 12. And the one we're looking at right now, chapter 13 to verse 18, is the test of prayerfulness. The last one is the test of true faith in chapter 5, verse 19 to verse 20. So if you get what I'm getting at right now, it is this. James, the book of James, is filled with a lot of sermons. It is filled with a lot of truth. It is filled with a lot of things that one could preach to the people of God so that the people of God could be sanctified, could grow in grace, and for those who are unsaved to be saved. So deciding which one of these sections to preach is very difficult. But the one I, took, I chose was chapter 5, verse 13 to verse 18, and we just read it. It's filled with a lot of truth. The section that we're going to be looking at, which is outlined in section 13, is the test of prayerfulness. But one could also name this the power of prayer. Now in speaking about this section, one must ensure that he reveals the purpose of prayer, which is to glorify God. One must ensure that he reveals the power of prayer, the privilege of prayer, the powerful prayer, and the powerless prayer. To do so, I must explain verse by verse, leading up to verse 16, which is our main text, our emphasis. Now, by way of introduction, I must speak about the author a little bit. Because what do we know about the author? What do we know about James, the man who wrote the book? We know that the author of this book, his name is James. How do we know that? Because he introduces himself in verse 1. Since you are already in the book of James, if you look at chapter 1, verse 1. The Word of God says, in chapter 1, verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. And we know if you study epistolary structure from the ancient world, how people usually start their letters is they start their letters with their names. That's why when you read Romans chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, Called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. That is how they usually start their letters, with their name. So we know that the author of this book is James. But did you know that the Bible speaks about four different men named James? You probably didn't know. I'm going to tell you who they are. The first one is James the Less, the son of Alphaeus, mentioned in Matthew chapter 10, verse 3. The second one is James, the father of Judas. That's not Judas Iscariot. That's Judas the betrayer, but rather Judas, a different Judas, mentioned in Luke 6, verse 16. The third James is the, is the James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. And the fourth one, which is the one who wrote this book, is James, the eldest brother of Jesus, mentioned in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, and the brother of Jude. The fourth one is the one who is the candidate who wrote this book. James, along with his brothers, were skeptical of Jesus during his earthly ministry. That is why when you read in John chapter 7, verse 5, it says that his brothers did not believe. The brothers of Jesus. But when you read 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, we learn that James, this brother of Jesus, who was skeptical during Jesus Christ's earthly ministry, he became converted after he saw the resurrected Christ. And when you look at church history, we learn about James from a man, a Jewish historian named Agesippus. He identified James as James the Just because of his extraordinary godliness, his zeal for obedience to the law of God, and his singular devotion to prayer. This is very interesting. This was said about James, that his knees became so callous from praying that they resembled the knees of camels. 
This is how much James would pray to God. This is how much James would pray. And when we think about ourselves today, about how much we pray, about how much time we spend with God in prayer, it is downright disgraceful. Some of us pray to God five minutes a day, one minute a day. Some of us don't pray to God at all. Some of us, if I were to ask you, when was the last time you prayed, you will take a moment to think. What if you had prayed that morning, you would have said, you know, I prayed this morning, or I prayed five minutes ago, or you just caught me, I just finished praying. Let's have a look at James' view of Christ, James' view of God. Because understanding the author of this book, we have to look at his life of prayer, who he was as a believer, and we also have to look at his knowledge about God. Because every believer, if he or she is not holy in his life and conduct, and if he or she does not know who God is, then their prayer will be powerless. Let's have a look at James. James said of God that God is the giver of wisdom. That's James chapter 1 verse 5. That God is holy and cannot be tempted with evil. That's James chapter 1 verse 13. That every good and perfect gift comes from God. That's James chapter 1 verse 17. That God is unchanging. That's James chapter 1 verse 17. That God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. That's James chapter 2 verse 5. That God is the one who has given the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments. And he is the great judge. That's James chapter 2 verse 11. We also know that God is one. And we believe in one God. That God is one being who exists eternally in three distinct persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We do not believe in many gods. We do not believe in a multiplicity of gods. We believe in one God. And James taught that in James chapter 2 verse 23. We also know that James also says that God is our Lord and Father in James chapter 3, verse 9. And that God is gracious, merciful, and compassionate. Look at James chapter 4, since you're already in the book of James. Verse 6 to verse 8. The Bible says these words in verse 6 to verse 8. But he gives... A greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we can also see this in chapter 5, verse 11. This truth that comes out before our eyes. The word of God says in verse 11, We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. That the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. This was written in the book of James. So we know that James has an accurate knowledge of God. An accurate knowledge of who God is. We could say that James knew God. We could say that James knew about God. And sadly today, if you were to ask majority of Christians, tell me about God. They don't know what to say. And the reason why they don't know what to say is because of their lack of knowledge. The Bible says that my people are destroyed because of a what? A lack of knowledge. The Bible says in first, well rather, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 18, that we are to grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This means that we are to be people who read God's word, who memorize God's word. As I said in my testimony earlier, I, I'm memorizing the book of Romans. I could quote the book of Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 from memory. If anyone were to ask me, what does chapter 2 verse 3 say? What does chapter 1 verse 8 say? I know exactly what it says because I have it memorized. Because I know that the word of God is my strength. The word of God is what feeds me. The word of God is what gives me the strength that I need to resist the temptations that come after me every day as a young man. The word of God says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 that we are to long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in regards to salvation. How many of us are longing for the pure milk of the word? How many of us are studying God's word? How many of us are seeking to know about God? Seeking to know God? Seeking to be a student of God's word? 
We know that James was a really good student of God's word because he said some very, very true things about God. Your prayer will have no power. Your prayer will have no effect if you are unholy and if you are one who has an incorrect view of God. When you look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, the word of God says something that's very, very important. Go there. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. The word of God says these words. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. A holy and righteous life is very important. The verse comes to mind from Romans, well, rather Psalms, chapter 66, verse 18, which says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. This is very, very important in that a Christian will think that he or she can live a life of immorality, impurity, sensuality, sinfulness, wickedness, unholiness, and then go on his or her knees at night and pray to God and say, God, help me through this. Help me through that. God, heal me. God, protect me. God, provide for me. And then wonder why God does not answer. And then instead of concluding that it is because of the life that he or she is living, they instead conclude that God is not real, that God does not exist, that God does not care. That God does not know him or her as a believer. But rather, it is because of the sinful life that he or she is living. Now let's explain this section. As I said before, this is a section that we, when you go through the book of James, it's section 13, verse 13 to verse 18, which speaks about the prayerfulness of the believer. Verse 13 says these words, going verse by verse through this section. It says these words, and since you're already in the book of James, this should be before your eyes. Chapter 5, verse 13 says these words, if anyone among you suffering, then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. It says that one suffering must pray. Now, as the Bible teaches elsewhere, the one who prays as a child of God must always pray with thankfulness. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. The Lord of God says these words from verse 16 to verse 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ. Turn to Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. The word of God says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. You must thank the Lord for everything. And this is for two reasons. Reason one. You are commanded to thank the Lord for everything. And if you think to yourself, uh, those books, the book of Thessalonians, the book of Colossians, it was written by a man named Paul. Why should I listen to Paul? The reason is given in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, which says, The words that I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Jesus Christ spoke through Paul. And he said that we are to thank him for all things. Another reason is this. Thanksgiving is a sacrifice to God. When you look at Psalm chapter 116, Psalm chapter 116, verse 17, the word of God says these words, To you I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. That's a very, very important verse. Thanksgiving is a sacrifice to God. And we can add the word, a pleasing sacrifice to God. When you wake up in the morning and you say, God, thank you for waking me up this morning. When you drink a glass of water, you say, God, thank you for this glass of water. When you have some bread and you say, God, thank you for this bread. That thankfulness is pleasing to God. But let's make it even more personal. When you are sick, 
And you say, God, thank you. That is pleasing to God. When you are without money and you say, God, thank you. That is pleasing to God. Understanding that God is the one who gives and God is the one who takes. Quoting the book of Job. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 12, these words, continuing on the topic of thanksgiving being a praise to God. The word of God says this. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Thanksgiving be to our God forever and ever. Thanksgiving is a sacrifice to God. So the one who suffers among you, as James chapter 5 verse 13 says, must pray with thanksgiving. Thanking God for the suffering, which can be identified as a trial that we go through in our Christian life. That's why when you look at James chapter 1, verse 2 to verse 4, and since you're already in the book of James, this should not be hard to find. James chapter 1, verse 2 to verse 4, it says these words, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now here's a question. Who is the author and finisher of faith? That's God. So if testing your faith through trials produces a stronger faith, then God is the author of your faith. Then God is the one that is ordaining you to go through trials so that you can become stronger. So that you can have a stronger faith. So that you, when you go through that same circumstance again, you remember when God took you out of it. And you can say these words, the Lord did it before, and the Lord will do it again. Amen. The Word of God also says in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, continuing on the same topic. Chapter 5, verse 3 to verse 5. It says these words. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So those of us who are suffering, in whatever way it is, we should know and acknowledge that God has a purpose in our suffering. I'll remind you again, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now this verse creates exclusivity. This is talking about those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Not everyone loves God. Not everyone is called according to his purpose. So one could say that the opposite is true. Not all things work together for good to those who are not called by God. Not all things work together for good to those who are not lovers of God, which should make those who don't love God very, very afraid. Which should make those who are not called by God very, very afraid. This should make those who are sinners living in this world and indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind very, very afraid. Because when you go through struggles in life, when you go through problems in life, you have to think to yourself, not all things work together for good for me because I'm not called by God and I'm not one who loves God. We must pray with thanksgiving. Praying and giving thanks to God as we pray for whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. This is suffering that the Christian goes through that is in accordance with the will of God. That is the suffering that he or she faces in the path of righteousness. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15 to verse 16. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15 to verse 16. The word of God says these very important words. Verse 15 says, Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, or thief, or evildoer, or a troublesome meddler, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. And then you look at verse 19, which solidifies what I'm saying. 
Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. This is very, very important. Because every Christian in this room can remember a time in your life when you were suffering, when you were in pain, when you were in struggle, when you were in a time that you would call unfortunate. But we get an example from the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 and 23. The same book that we are currently in. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 to verse 23. The word of God says, For you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Entrusting yourself to God in your suffering according to the will of God for bad deeds or for good deeds is praying to God with thanksgiving in your heart, knowing that the Lord gives and the Lord takes. The Lord gives and the Lord takes. Now this brings me to a very, very controversial topic. I made a system when I was 20 years old, a system that I used to read through the entire Bible every 30 days. And I did that eight times until I noticed that it is a very faulty system because you don't get to the New Testament until halfway through the month. So I made a new system, getting through the Bible in 26 days, where you read an Old Testament passage, then you read a New Testament passage, and then you can keep going day by day, day by day, until day 26, when you are through the entire Bible. And you see some things in God's Word that shock you. You see some things in God's Word that shock your tradition. Because I grew up hearing words like this. God never inflicts sickness on anyone. I grew up hearing words like God does not cause anyone to be poor. I grew up hearing words like God does not cause anyone to suffer. And then I read through the Bible and I get to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 18 which says these words. So after all this, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable sickness. Now it came about in the course of time, at the end of two years, that his bowels came out because of his sickness, and he died in great pain, and his people made no fire for him, but the fire for his father. I also grew up hearing words like this, God does not cause anyone to be blind, dumb, or deaf. And then you think about the words of Exodus chapter 4, verse 11, which says these words. The Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? And you think about those passages and you're like, wow, wait a minute. When people say that God does not inflict sickness, when people say that God does not cause suffering, when people say that God does not ordain or decree that people are poor, you think about passages like Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 2, which says these words, The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. And you think about Job chapter 34, verse 19, which says, these words, which are relating to the verse that we read before. The Bible says in verse 19, Who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich above the poor, for they all are the work of his hand. You think about the words of Hannah when Hannah had her prayer answered in 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. We hear the words of Hannah when she said this about God. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. And then you start to get puzzled. And then you start to wonder, how am I going to answer these questions from the traditions I've been told growing up as a young man? Being somebody who wants to be a pastor one day and never getting the chance to go to college. I study very, very hard. I study very, very diligently. My wife complains sometimes when she says, you need to spend more time with me. 
and less time in your books because you're always studying. And then you realize that this is not a contradiction. It is simply this. God does these things for two reasons and two reasons only. He inflicts sickness. He allows people to be poor. He allows people to suffer for two reasons. Reason one, for judgment. For judgment. There are those who are not believers. There are those who are wicked. There are those who continue day after day giving God dishonor and rebelling against God. And they fall sick. They are poor. They are without. They are in lack. Their family is cursed. And you look at that and you conclude that it is because of the judgment of God. And then you look at the other reason, reason number two. God allows, God decrees, God permits his children, his people to go through poverty, to go through sickness at times, to go through suffering at times for blessing and sanctification. And we can see this in John chapter 9. The word of God says these words. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Now we know that the Lord is the one who makes mute, who makes deaf, who makes blind. Exodus chapter 4 verse 11. A man born blind and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? These people have the same tendency and belief that we have today. Whenever we see someone going through suffering, whenever we see someone going through something bad, we automatically think to ourselves, Why do I wrong? What kind of sin commit? Why do I do? Why do I do? Like I remember a time when so I, have, I, have a, I have one child, I have a daughter, but I always wanted to have five children. So when me and my wife, we, we tried again, we, we had a miscarriage, we tried again, we had a miscarriage again. A lady had the audacity to look at me and say to me, is your life pleasing to God? Is your life pleasing to God, young man? You lost two babies? What went through my mind to say to her was not pleasing to God, so I didn't say anything. But people think that when someone goes through something bad in their life, it is because they are doing something wrong. And even in ancient times, that is what people thought back then. Is it this man or his parents who have sinned? Here's what Jesus said. It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So God will ordain, God will decree suffering, pain, poverty, so that his works can be shown in your life. Can you think about this for a moment? If you've never been without money, how would you know that God can provide? If you've never been sick, how would you know that God can heal? If you've never been without anything, how will you know that God is the giver of everything? God ordains, God decrees that we go through things in our life. And when we hear the words of James, in James chapter 5, verse 13, if any man is suffering, he is to pray. And we know it is prayer with thanksgiving. Lord, I am suffering. And I am praying, Lord, that you will change my circumstance. And you say, God, thank you for the suffering. Because I don't know why I'm suffering. I don't know the reason why I'm suffering. I don't know what your purpose is. But I know that your purpose is good. I know that your purpose is going to work out for good. Yes. We thank God for our suffering rather than saying, God, how dare you cause me to go through this? Look at what I've done for you. Look at all the things I've done for you. I preach every Sunday. I give tithe every Sunday. I witness to the lost. I go to church. How dare you cause me to be sick? How dare you cause me to be poor? How dare you allow the devil to come into my life and cause me to get sick and cause me to be without something in my life? And the worst one, how dare you cause my child to die? How dare you take away my health? We pray to God in this fashion sometimes. And I may not say we, I may say some Christians pray to God in that fashion. Lord, look what me do for you. Look what you do to me. When you study 
to be a pastor, you go through something called systematic theology. You'd learn 10 categories of theology. There's bibliology, which is the study of the Bible. It is taken from two Greek words, biblos and logia, meaning Bible or books and the word word. Logia means word. So it is a word about the books of the Bible. So when you study bibliology, you learn how the Bible was compiled, how the Bible was transmitted, how the Bible was translated, how the Bible was written. You learn all these things in systematic theology. The next one you learn is theology proper. You learn about God the Father or paterology, the Greek word petros, which means father, and logia, meaning word. You learn a word about the Father. Then you learn about Christology, meaning Christ, the study of Christ. Pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. Then you learn about anthropology, the study of man through the scriptures, the study of angelology. I don't even have to explain that one. You know what it means, angelology, the study of angels through the Bible. Then you learn about soteriology, the study of salvation. You learn about ecclesiology, the study of the church, eschatology, the study of last things. And when you compile these things and you know theology, when you encounter passages that seem to contradict your tradition and seem to contradict the feelings that you had in your heart about who God is and about what God does, it allows you to understand how these things come together. God is sovereign and God does as he pleases with his creation. And he does in the life of believers only that which is good. And this should give us encouragement. This should make us feel happy. This should make us feel excited and know that nothing I am going through right now has not been decreed by God. So if anyone in this room is suffering, if anyone in this room is going through something that's so unfortunate, you have to trust and you have to know that God's hand is working out for good. God's hand is doing something marvelous. God's hand is working something out for good. And this comes to mind when you are cooking, as my wife loves to cook, when you are making something called brown stew chicken, if you separate all the ingredients and eat them individually, like the browning, the, the, the black pepper, the, the onions, the, the seasonings, and I don't, I, I don't cook, so I don't know the list. If you separate them individually and put each of them in your mouth individually, you're gonna have a very bad experience. But when you put them all together, you have an amazing meal. You have an amazing experience. Some of us go through poverty. Some of us go through sickness. Some of us go through pain. Some of us go through lack. Some of us go through a family member losing their life. Some of us go through the agonizing pain of watching your child being sick. All of these things that seem to be bad at the moment work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I can remember the words of of Joseph when he looked at his brothers in uh, Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 he said this to his brothers you meant evil against me but God meant it for good we often hear the words God turned it around for good that's not what the passage says it says God meant it what is the direct antecedent for it it's evil God meant evil for good the bad things that Joseph went through his brothers sold him the bad things he went through, his brothers hated him. The bad things he went through, his brothers threw him into a pit. Then he went into Potiphar's house and he was accused of rape. All of those bad things, all of those evil things. He said to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. All the bad things that we go through, God means it for good. So we are to be thankful for everything, not just the good. Not just the good. We must be thankful for everything because we know that the hand of God is working in our life to create a masterpiece. If anyone suffers, he is to pray with thanksgiving. If anyone suffers, he is to pray with thanksgiving. And we also read in Psalm chapter 147, verse 7, that thanksgiving is praises to God. Thanksgiving is praises to God. But let's look at the second part of the verse. James chapter 5 verse 13. James chapter 5 verse 13. Because I only explained half of the verse. I said that if anyone is suffering among you, he is to pray. And we know that this is prayer with thanksgiving. But then when you continue on reading along in that same verse, 
the verse also says this. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. If anyone cheerful, he is to sing praises. So we see the opposite side of the spectrum. Suffering on the one hand and cheerfulness on the other hand. And this summarizes the entire Christian life. You go through suffering and you go through cheerfulness. You go through bad times and you go through good times. And we see the reaction that we must have on both sides. When you go through suffering, you pray with thanksgiving. When you go through joyfulness, peace, and good things, you sing praises to God. But what is this talking about? How do we define praises to God? When you look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, the writer to the Hebrews gives us the definition of what praise is. The definition of what praise is. The writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, these very amazing words. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. So what do you do when you are joyful? What do you do when you are facing good things in your life? You sing praises to God. And what does that mean? You sing thankfulness to God. You say, God, thank you for the good. Thank you for all the good things that you have done for me. Wake up in the morning, you thank God that he woke you up this morning. You had breakfast, you thank God that he gave you breakfast. You had time to spend with your children. You had time to spend with your husband. You thank God for everything that you go through in your life. And continuing on, the next verse, verse 14. And verse 14 cannot be interpreted in disjunction from verse 15 and verse 16. So we have to read them all together. Chapter 5, verse 14 to verse 16, it says these words. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church. And they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. It is very important that we get the point that James is bringing across. And if many of you didn't know, there was a time when the Bible was not divided into chapters and verses. So we have to read this in context. Verse 15, we hear the mention of elders. Why is it that we are to call for the elders when someone is sick in the church? To anoint the sick in the church and to pray simply because they have a holy and righteous life and they have a correct view of God. When you read 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 to verse 7 and Titus chapter 1 verse 6 to verse 9, I've been going for a while, so I'm not going to be reading these passages. But in these passages, we hear the qualifications for an elder. The qualifications for a pastor. The qualifications that if the pastor or the elder loses one of these qualifications, he is to either step down or go and do something else. And these qualifications are these. When you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and Titus chapter 1, verse 6, he must be above reproach. This must be the husband of one wife. If this man is married and he has more than one wife, he's unqualified to be a pastor. He's unqualified to be a shepherd. He must be sober-minded. 1 Timothy 2, well, chapter 3, verse 2. If this is a man who loves his liquor every night and he gets drunk Saturday night before he comes to church on Sunday, he's not qualified. This man must be self-controlled, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. If the least little insult he gets from the outside world, he bursts out in anger and tries to fight, he's not qualified. This man must be disciplined, must be structured. That is why I admire Pastor Miller. He's always at church on time. He's always here waiting. 
But there are pastors in this world who purposefully go to church late because they don't want to see the Sunday school. They don't want to be involved. I heard one pastor say that um, <clears throat> I don't want any milk, so I don't go to Sunday school. Church starts at a certain time. Be there at a certain time. This man must be respectable. This man must be hospitable. This man must be able to teach, which means he knows God's word. And sadly, I have to say this, there are pastors that don't know God's word. There are those who are leading God's people. There are those who are preaching to God's people, and they do not know God's word. There are times when I sit down in church and I listen to people preach, and I really have to put my finger to my chin and wonder, where did they get that? Where did they see that? As a young man who reads God's word every day, I've never seen certain things that certain pastors preach about in God's word. And it's simply because they don't know God's word or they know God's word and purposefully twist God's word. And we know that man of God, this man, he must not be violent, but he must be gentle. He must not be quarrelsome. He must not be quick tempered. He must not be a lover of money. First Timothy chapter three, verse three, because if a pastor loves money, what you will find is that the sermon continually is about money. It's about giving. It's about sowing. It's about putting in the basket when he must be preaching the undiluted word of God. He preaches every Sunday about giving. This pastor or this man of God must not be greedy for gain. This man of God must be a skillful manager of his household if he is a man with a wife and children. Because the Bible says, if a man cannot manage his own household, how will he manage the household of God? Which is the church. You may hear about pastors who have children who are out of control. They come to church and they wonder why the church is out of control. Simply because they have not passed the first test. He must be a keeper of his children. His children must be learning the word of God consistently and, and, and continually. Simply because the word of God commands this in Ephesians chapter 6. That the fathers must raise their children up in the discipline of the Lord. This man must be someone who is not a new convert. In that the moment Brother James is baptized, let's make him a pastor. The moment he gets baptized, let's turn him into a pastor. Let's put him in the pulpit and put him over the charge of God's people. He must not be a new convert. Because the scripture says in 1 Timothy 3 verse 6 that he might become puffed up with pride. This man must not be arrogant. He must have a good reputation to outsiders. He must be a lover of good and he must be holy. To summarize all of these qualifications of the man of God, the minister, the pastor. We can say these words. He must be holy and he must know God. These are the men who are called to anoint the sick with oil, to pray over the sick. And then the passage says, the prayer of the righteous man availeth much, accomplishes much. So you notice the consistency of the thought pattern of James. He's continuing on by saying, these are the men we called, men who have a good reputation, men who are knowledgeable about God, men who are holy. And if these men pray, the prayer of the righteous man will accomplish much. And this individual will be healed. This individual will be healed. That is what the word of God shows us in these passages. I've gone for 48 minutes. I don't want to go for more than that. I'm going to spend two more minutes continuing on with verse 16. Verse 16 says in James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 16. The word of God says these words. James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another. It says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. When you look at verse 16, 
It says these words, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another so that you may be healed. In verse 15, we learn that this healing is healing from sickness. And in verse 16, we learn that this healing is healing from unforgiven sin. There are two ways that people can be sick. People can be sick physically or spiritually. In verse 15, we see the physical sickness. And in verse 16, we see the spiritual sickness. And we see the promise of healing of them both. According to the will of God. Someone who is sick in their body is someone who is facing a illness. Someone who is sick in their spirit is someone who is a sinner, not saved. They're sick. The Bible describes them as dead in their trespasses and sins. Or a Christian who is spending too much time with a particular sin. A child of God who continues to live in sin. This individual is sick. And we hear... Confess your sins to one another. Pastors are provided by God for us to go to them at times and say, Pastor, I'm struggling with this sin or that sin. The pastor prays over you. The pastor guides you. The pastor leads you because the pastor knows the word of God. And this individual will go through healing from that sickness. This individual will go through healing from that sin that he or she continues to walk around with. I promised before that in this passage, in verse 16 alone, we can find five points. The power of prayer, the purpose of prayer, the privilege of prayer, the powerful prayer, and the powerless prayer. This is an entire series that we're not going to be going through today. But I want to close by saying these words. Your prayer is powerful. Your prayer to God has power when you live a life that is pleasing to God and when you know about God. The definition of prayer is tied to what I just said. Prayer is an offering up of our desires to God in the name of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit or with the help of the Holy Spirit, with confession of our sins, and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. One must know who God is. One must know about God. One must have knowledge about God in order for one to pray to the true God. Because we all know that there are people who believe that other gods exist. For example, in the religion of Hinduism, they believe in a multiplicity of gods. And we know that in other religions, people believe things about God that are outrageous. There are people on YouTube who are saying that God is a woman. That God is a black woman. That the black woman is God. And they pray to her every night. Having a correct view of God is very important. Which is supposed to motivate us to study God's word. Motivate us to learn about God. Motivate us to feed on his word so that we can know his word. And then when we fall on our knees to pray to God, we know who we are praying to. We know that this God answers prayer. We know that this God hears prayer. We know that this God loves us so much that he is willing to answer our prayer when we fall before his throne of grace in time of need. The righteous man, the righteous man, that's why we hear in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that you may become the righteousness of God in him. Romans chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not take his sin into account. The righteous man is the Christian whose sins have been forgiven, whose sins have been washed away, and whose life shows that he or she is truly saved. And this Christian, whenever he or she gets down on their knees or sits down or stands to pray, the power of prayer is to cause God to move on their behalf Amen. and answer Amen. their prayer. Amen. So brethren, all I can do is hope that in this 55 minutes, you have learned something that you can use in your life, that you learn something that is practical, that you will become diligent.
diligent students of God's word. We know this verse by heart because we hear it all the time. Study to show yourself approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed. Rightly. Dividing the word of truth. Which means that there is a way to wrongly divide the word of truth. Study God's word. Pray to God. He's always ready. He's always willing to hear your prayer and to answer your prayer. Let us pray. Father, I come before your throne because you have given me the privilege to come before your throne, the same privilege that you have given every believer to come before your throne and pray to you because of the access that we have, the access that we did not have before. If your word says that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Your word also says that no one can come to the Father except through me. Only through Jesus can we go before your throne. And it, only, it is only those of us who are in Christ who can go before your throne. For your word says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So I come before your throne, Father, to ask that you will bless the hearers with the message that they heard. That you will cause them to be sanctified. That you will cause them to study your word, to know about you more. To grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ as you have commanded in your, in your word. And that we will be motivated to pray knowing that our Father, our loving Father is willing and waiting at all times for us to pray to him and ask whatever we may ask. And know that if it is according to his will, we will receive it. And I also ask you, Father, that you will help us to live this life. Help us to live this life as a believer. For your word says that it is you who is at work in us, both to will and to work for your good pleasure. That is why we cannot take any glory for ourselves when we choose at any given moment not to sin. We should instead say, God, thank you that you did not allow me. Thank you that you held me back. Thank you that you gave me the strength to resist. Help us, Lord, to live this life. And I ask that you will bless our pastor, bless our bishop, a faithful man of God who knows your word and who preaches your word faithfully and who is diligent to be here before everyone gets here to make sure that your house is open for your people. I pray that you will keep him strong, keep him smart, smart, keep him healthy so that he may continue to preach your word. And I ask God that you will allow us to all go home safely today and that you will allow us all to come back Sunday morning, Wednesday night for the next services that will be going on in the future. I ask this Lord and many more blessings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.